<laughs> Sherry Dyser joins us from the uh, North Dakota Game and Fish Department. Uh, her presentation will be on habitats of North Dakota. She works with K-12 schools and universities to implement the habitats of North Dakota curriculum. She also offers a graduate workshops for educators in the summer. In addition to working with Habitat programs, she assists with hunter education and other outdoor educational programs that the department offers. Please welcome Sherry Neiser. Thanks, Al. Um, this presentation is going to um, talk about the Habitats of North Dakota, not only as a curriculum that we have available, but also just to develop awareness that we have five unique characteristic habitats with different characteristics in, throughout the state. Um, this picture was actually taken at my friend's farm northwest of Minot. And um, you can see it's just a bloom with purple prairie clover. Um, and it was, there were a number of um, NDSU University graduate students that were doing pollinator workshops and um, collection data. And they found that this field had the most pollinators of any place else they tested. So that was very exciting news for my friends and also for the researchers from NDSU. And it's a beautiful spot. Okay. Oops, there we go. Okay, so about the curriculum. It was originally published in 2008 as part of the North Dakota Studies curriculum for fourth grade. Um, some of you may remember the original North Dakota Studies curriculum. It was printed in black and white and the font was about size four. So not great, great educational materials for 10 year olds, which is about fourth grade. Um, so when the Department of Independent Studies decided to redo the North Dakota Studies curriculum, we jumped on board and included these habitat guides. And so our habitat guides are standards based for both North Dakota studies, which is fourth grade, as well as, as life science standards for third through sixth grade. Now, having said that, um, we have seen them in every grade and special ed as resource materials. They're visually pleasing. Um, we have pictures, we have diagrams, photographs, we have text in different colors, there's charts. And so there's enough variety within these guides that they appeal to just about all learning styles. So if you have a student who's reading below grade level, there's still enough in the text to keep them interested. The Habitats of North Dakota curriculum is found online at the website listed at the top of the page. And so you can see this is a screenshot of our website for the Habitats program. And so each Habitat guide is available in a PDF format. And then in addition, there's also a supplementary video associated with each Habitat. So if you're talking about the Badlands, for example, but you can't swing a field trip out to the Badlands, you can view the supplementary video and it takes you on a virtual field trip of that Habitat. Um, we also have a teacher resource guide without the front cover. Um, you can download it in PDF. There's lots of reproducibles. There's answers to questions in the guides. And so um, it's something that teachers can use. We have chosen not to print it anymore because it's heavy. It kills a lot of trees. And um, we find that teachers would prefer to just download the pages they need. But that is available also on our website. So I thought we'd just level the playing field to make sure everybody knows what a habitat is and, and um, before we get started looking at the different habitats in the state. So a habitat is defined by dictionary.com as the natural environment of an organism. And so it includes food, water, shelter, adequate space, and the proper arrangement of food, water, shelter, and space. So think about it this way, if there is a flood along the Missouri River, you have water. There might be a little bit of food and shelter, maybe some space, but is the water in the proper arrangement or proportion? And the answer to that is of course, no. And so that is not a good habitat. The same can, we can look at it in a drought event. We can look at, at 
um, an area where animals are overcrowded, there's too many and there's not enough food. So there's lots of different scenarios that we can apply the concept of habitat to. But a good habitat includes a place where an animal or a human, we're animals too, has a place to live, shelter, they have food, they have water, because water is important to all forms of life. And then we have enough space so we don't feel cramped. And the space is important for mental health. And that includes animals too, because if they're too close together, they tend to fight just like people do. They just exhibit that a little differently. So instead of thinking about habitat as a home, think about it as a neighborhood. So you, it, within your neighborhood, you have a grocery store and you have some other resources that you need to make a good habitat. So we're gonna look at the prairie first. A lot of people refer to the prairie as grasslands. Um, we chose to identify this habitat as prairie because grasslands creates a visual picture of just grass. And let's face it, prairie is more than just grass. So within our state, prairies are found statewide. It is a treeless region for the most part, covered with grasses, of course, forbs, which are, is a fancy word for wildflowers, and then shrubs. It's also home to the prairie rose, which is our state flower. The prairie is known for long, hot summers and um, long winters and lots of wind. It's when time began, the prairie has been troubled by fire. Um, you look at historical accounts by early settlers and their biggest fear was not, was not wild animals, it was fire. And so um, that was always a concern. The prairie is also preferred by grazing animals like bison or, or livestock or even deer. We talked about deer um, yesterday and how they're well adapted to the prairie habitat. So in North Dakota, we have three specific types of prairie. Um, the tall grass prairie is located in Eastern North Dakota. Prior to settlement, North Dakota had over 2 million acres of tall grass prairie. Sadly, only about 10% of that remains. And so you can see the tall grass prairie on the Eastern um, side of the state. It is mostly found in the Red River Valley area of the state. And so the reason it, we have lost so much of the the tall grass prairie is due to the Bonanza ranches beginning in about 1870s. And they plowed up the prairie because we know that the Red River Valley soil is, is very rich and, and grows a good crop. There are a few remnants of tall grass prairie. There's one up by Kelly Slough near Grand Forks and um, down by Lisbon in the Cheyenne River National Grasslands. You can find some tall grass prairie too. Um, if you ever get the opportunity to take that field trip, know that the, that the vegetation height is about six foot. So I'm 5'2", and walking through tall grass prairie is pretty intimidating to me. Our next um, prairie type is mixed grass, and it, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a combination of tall and short grass species. It's found in central North Dakota, so you think um, most of the state actually, and it makes up about 30% of North Dakota. And looking at that map, you say it's more than 30%, but think about it this way, we've got some other habitats mixed in. So, so um, that's why it's only 30%. And chances are, this is what you'll see if you go out around Bismarck, the mixed grass prairie. Short grass prairie is found in Southwestern North Dakota precipitation averages 10 to 12 inches a year. Generally, the soil is less fertile. And so um, that's what you see um, out west. And most of the short grass prairie, if you're not an adventurer, you can find it in the National Grasslands or in Teddy Roosevelt National Park. The Badlands were formed by erosion and found in are found in the southwestern part of the state. The reason it's called the Badlands is because early French explorers, when they would cross that area, they referred to it as a Badland to cross, to travel across. Now, if you think about it, if you drive out that way, you stay on a road. But imagine if you're making your way across the Badlands on foot, 
it would be an interesting um, journey for sure. So the great thing about the Badlands is it's comprised of 90% native vegetation. So it's as it was 100 years ago for the most part. Over 1 million acres of land is owned by the public, including the national grasslands and the national park. So it is owned by you and I and everybody out there listening. Um, Badlands are often called a hidden treasure because they are unique to North Dakota. And there are a few species that are only found in the Badlands of North Dakota. For instance, the, the shorthorn lizard or people commonly refer to this fellow as the horny toad. And so I've, that's the only place you'll find him in the state. The other thing about the Badlands is it is the home of the Little Missouri River, which is designated wild and scenic. And so that's a special designation that the Department of Interior gives to, to rivers based on their, their wildness. They're, they're in a, designated in a wilderness area that there isn't pollution, there isn't development. And so that is really a gift to our state. Um, if you try to cross it in August, you can probably just wait across it right now. There is some flow in it, um, though this year the water is down a little bit due to our drought. So when you think of Badlands, you can think of fossils. Badlands is rich in fossil, fossils. If you go down in the very southwestern corner of the state near Marmoth, there are a number of field camps for dinosaurs, and they brought out a number of dinosaur um, fossils from that part of the state. And so, and they are on display at the Historical Society here in Bismarck. Um, petrified forests, of course, the, the south unit of the Teddy Roosevelt National Park has a petrified forest hiking loop, but you don't have to go into the park to see the petrified forest. You just drive around it and there are acres and acres of large logs that have been petrified and, and they're on national grasslands and you can walk up and see them all. They're really pretty cool to see. It also has some unique habitat. In the Badlands, it is the only place in the state, the only habitat that has a naturally occurring coniferous forest. Coniferous forests are, are conifers or trees that, that are evergreens. They never lose their leaves or needles and their seeds are in cones. It also um, is unique because it's an area where a number of different habitats come together, including short grass prairie, woody draws, um, riparian habitats, and even some woodlands. So you get everything if you go out to the Badlands. One of the cool things about that coniferous forest is the closest forest that resembles um, that habitat is down in the Black Hills. So there's been a lot of theories floated as far as how we ended up with the evergreens here in the Badlands. Um, I think the most popular theory is that the seeds were transported by animals and, and dropped there and that's how the forest came to be. Woodlands in the state makes up only about 2% of the state. And um, when I give this presentation and sometimes I, I talk to students from Montana or Minnesota where they really do have have large woodlands. They kind of they kind of chuckle at me, but um, we we own every tree we have. And so this is a graphic from the curriculum guide. We've got four specific types of forests or woodlands in the state, and so they're designated by color. The brown is the ponderosa and Rocky Mountain juniper juniper woodlands down in the Badlands. The bur oak is the green, which is found near Devil's Lake and um, the Pemina Gorge area. The aspen birch, which is your orange up there, is found in the Turtle Mountains, the sand hills um, near Towner. And then there is a group over by the Pemina Gorge area as well. And then um, the last major woodland area are the elm, ash, and cottonwood forests. And they fall along our river areas. And so you can see them along the Red River and tributaries, that's our Eastern border. The Surus Loop, um, which is North Central, and then um, the Missouri River and its tributaries in Central and Southwestern North Dakota. 
So we do have some state forests in the state. Um, the North Dakota State Forest Service um, operates these facilities. We have the Turtle Mountain State Forest and the Homan State Forest up in the Turtle Mountains. The Mouse River State Forest along the Turtle River. The Tea Trot Woods up um, in the Pemina Gorge area and the Cheyenne River State Forest. And so those are state lands in addition to other woodlands that we have in the state. So as I said before, oh no, you can. The woodlands only um, occupy 2% of our state. And so not a huge impact, but we do have quite a few, even with only 2%. Um, when Lake Sakakawea was filled after the dam was built, thousands of acres of native forests were flooded. And so we lost a number of our native forests through that event. Um, some of our, our trees can last up to 400 years and those are oak. And then um, the largest fire in North Dakota actually occurred in the Turtle Mountains back in 1886. Since then, um, a lot of the Turtle Mountains woodlands have regrown and there are some areas of the Turtle Mountains where you can still see scars from that fire over a hundred years ago. And then lastly, our state tree is the American elm, which is threatened by Dutch elm disease. So some fun facts. The leaves from the trees filter the air by removing dust and other particles. So it behooves us to, to plant a tree. Um, the vegetation underneath and around um, the trunk of the tree decomposes and it enriches soil. The roots of the tree hold soil and reduce erosion. So in a dry year, that's really important. And then one acre of forest or woodland absorbs about six tons of carbon dioxide and produces four tons of oxygen. And we know we need that. And then trees provide shade for buildings and which ultimately will reduce energy costs. So anytime you see a a new development going in, you can encourage those developers to plant trees as part of their, their development process because it's not only good for the environment, but it's good for, for their development as well. So just a couple of pictures of the different types of forests gives you an idea of what they look like. This is the Ponderosa Pine and Rocky Mountain Juniper Forest in the Badlands. We've got the Burr Oak Forest up in the, the Pemina Gorge area. And this is what most people think of when they think of kind of a rich, lush forest. Um, Aspen birch forest in the Turtle Mountains. The one thing about aspen and birch is they reproduce by suckering. So um, their roots underground grow and then they'll, they'll pop up a shoot and another tree will begin to grow. And so that's why they're really close together. Not great for, for walking through the woods, but certainly environmentally very beneficial. The elm, ash, and cottonwood forests along our, our river areas. This is actually taken just north of Bismarck along the Missouri River. And you can see that it was taken in the fall by the color of the leaves. And one, we have a couple other forests that aren't specific to any type of, of tree. Um, one of them is woody draws. And woody draws are considered woodlands because they have trees. Um, but there's small, small patches of trees that are interspersed in prairie and other habitats. And so usually they, you see them going up a hill. Um, they not only contain deciduous trees and evergreens, but a lot of fruit bearing shrubs like Juneberry, choke cherry, and buffalo berries. So if, you, if you're interested in picking berries, look for these woody draws. Other types of forests that you may not think of as a forest, um, shelter belts out in the country and around developments, they're planted for windbreaks and erosion control. Lord knows we do have wind in North Dakota. Um, and the last type of forest that I wanna talk about are urban or community forests. And this is actually a picture of a house just up the street from my place. Um, they have the most beautiful yard. They've got it landscaped with all different kinds of trees. And so that is actually part of a community or urban forest. So every tree that you plant in your yard, you are also part of becoming part of that community forest. 
So let's shift gears um, and look at wetlands. Wetlands are part of what's called the prairie pothole region. And you can see that indicated in that, that blue in the map on the slide. Um, goes all the way from Canada, Northern Alberta, all the way down into Iowa and takes in everything in between. Um, potholes are actually wetlands that are formed by glaciers. So a wetland can be a pothole, but it's also there are also other types of wetlands as well. Um, but potholes and the wetlands in North Dakota are formed by glaciers in the last advance about 12,000 years ago. So some cool things about wetlands. First of all, they trap pollution. And let's face it, if we have less pollution, the world's gonna be a better place. They also reduce flooding. So this year it's not a big deal because we're in a drought, but if you live next to any river, um, you wanna keep your options for flooding to a minimum. Um, otherwise you might end up with a, a wet basement or worse. Um, they also reduce erosion. And because of all those things, trapping pollution, reducing flooding, reducing erosion, they improve water quality, which is always good. And they recharge groundwater. So if you happen to live in a place where you draw your water from a well, that recharging of the groundwater is very important to you. So how do you define a wetland? Well, it's really pretty simple. Um, if we get away from all the scientific jargon, basically a wetland has to have water. It has to have wetland plants, things like cattails and some really obvious plants, but there's also a number of plants that maybe aren't obvious to the average person that are still considered a wetland plant. And they also have to have wetland soil. Wetland soil is different from what you would um, plant your garden in. Um, wetland soil is, is stinky because it has a lot of decaying organic matter. Um, it's usually gray in color. And in most cases, it's kind of, oh, it's not like a clay, but it's really kind of, it has a sticky texture. So it's a very distinct type of soil. So if you've got an area that has all of these factors, you have a wetland. So there are different types of wetlands. And once again, we could go into the scientific jargon, but I don't wanna do that because it gets lost even on me. So let's take a look at what they are and what they do. Um, the first type of wetland is just a temporary wetland. It's a shallow depression that holds water for a few weeks. It's a really great source of food for birds because, because it's so shallow that water warms up in a hurry and the bugs emerge and the migrating birds can, can eat them up. And this is helpful when they migrate up from the south. Um, they stop for a quick snack and then they can move on continue their migratory journey. Seasonal wetlands are water that contain, or wetlands that contain water until about mid-July. They have two zones of vegetation. And what that means is that the water is ringed by cattails or some other type of, of wetland plant. And um, they also have um, kind of floating or, or plants that are underneath the water in the center of the wetland. These type of wetlands make actual excellent habitat for baby ducks um, because there are places to hide and there's usually a lot of insects there as well. So great food source. Semi-permanent wetlands hold water year round most years. This year they probably won't. Um, there's three vegetation zones in addition to um, the two zones that we talked about with the uh, temporary wetlands. There is also um, an outer um, zone where it's made of wet meadow plants like asters, for example, are considered a wet meadow plant. There's a lot of flowers in that, that part of the, the wetland. And then we also have permanent wetlands. So these hold, year, hold water year round, even in drought years. They include lakes, ponds, reservoirs. So if you've got an area that is a dam, a man-made dam, it's still considered a permanent wetland. Lake Sakakawea um, is considered a permanent wetland because it holds water every year. So shifting gears again, we're gonna look at riparian habitats. This is another aquatic habitat. And so riparian habitats have a river, 
or a stream that flow through. And then they also have a land area adjacent to that river. So if you look out, say, I think most everybody here is from Bismarck and you look at the Missouri River, there's an area of land that's adjacent to the river that's flat um, in both directions. Um, that would also be part of your riparian habitat. And so you've got that floodplain area that's flat and then you have the water area. Um, it can be anywhere from five feet, depending on the size of the, the stream to almost a quarter mile wide, like for example, with the Missouri River. Um, it includes trees, Forbes, and then also um, sandbars. So that habitat in the middle of the river that's exposed, those sandbars, that's part of the riparian habitat. One cool thing about sandbars is they are critical habitat for piping plovers and least term. That's where they, they have their nests, they lay their eggs, and they, they um, rear their young before they fledge. So should be a good year for piping plovers and, and least terns this year. Um, Lakes Kakwea and, and Lake Oahe were created by dams on the Missouri River. And so um, that does impact our riparian habitat um, because those areas are impoundments and the water doesn't really flow like a river should. So it impacts um, animals that need to travel up or downstream through the water, fish and other aquatic animals. So some cool things to know about habitats, riparian habitats, they are one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. Um, and the reason for this is you have that, that flowing river area and then you also have the land area. And the combination of the two just makes for fantastic um, production um, from a flora and fauna perspective. Um, another thing, and this is something that if you work, live on a river, what happens upstream affects what happens downstream. So if you dump chemicals, you, you over fertilize your yard into a river or a stream, all that's gonna flow downstream and it's gonna affect everybody that lives below you. The Missouri River is also home to the endangered pallid sturgeon. So that's kind of a cool fun fact. And we do see them in, in the Missouri River. Um, they, they have to have undammed Missouri River to complete their life cycle. So there are portions of the river that they still live on. So looking at our state, um, I'm always amazed by people who, who aren't familiar with the rivers that we have in the state. Um, we've got three major river systems. We have the Missouri River, which is um, Western and South part of the state. And um, then we have the Suris River, which is a loop that comes down from Canada and then flows back up into Canada. Um, and you can see that in North Central. I was at a workshop once and I had a, a, num a few teachers that were unfamiliar with the Suris River. So we, we fixed that in a hurry. Um, and then the Red River system, which is our Eastern border and then all the tributaries. We've also got a couple of water bodies that we didn't mention in the wetlands. We've got Devil's Lake, and then Long Lake, which is just east of Bismarck. This is a, a graphic, an assessment actually that comes out of the teacher resource guide to help teachers um, assess students as far as their knowledge of, of river systems in the state. So just, just a glimpse of what the different river systems look like. Up at the top, we've got the Suris River. Um, you've got that nice forested woody area adjacent to it. It's kind of a slow moving um, river. We've got the, the Grand Missouri um, in the middle, and then we've got the Red River um, on the bottom. And so you can see they all have their own unique characteristics and look a little different. Um, some of our tributaries that we have in the state, um, you can see those at the top. The, the Lax River is nice and windy. The Little Missouri, which I remember I said was part of the um, wild and scenic river system. James River. James River actually looks like a big slough. You can see it's got some cattails and it's very slow moving. And then the Cheyenne River, of course, is, is nicely treed and um, is another beautiful river system that we have in the state. 
So we do have some threats to all habitats. Some threats are very unique. Some threats to happen and they're just specific to um, one habitat. But these are threats to all habitats. And so one of the first things we always look at is, remember when I was talking about the badlands, I said 90% of the badlands is all native plants. So one of the threats to any area that has native plants are exotic species. And those are species that are not found here naturally. They're brought in from other parts of the country or other countries. And so the top one everybody's probably familiar with is leafy spurge is that yellow, yellowy green um, plant. The flowers look like cups almost. Um, it, cattle won't eat it. It affects, it, it spreads very quickly and will choke out native plants. So not a desirable species. That middle plant with the pink on the end, it's, if, you, if you're an horticulturist and you want some ornamental plants in your yard, you probably look at that and, and think it's really pretty, and it is. But um, you find this out in Western North Dakota along the Little Missouri. Um, I don't know how it got to the state, but it's here. And so what this is, it's um, salt cedar. And it grows along the Little Missouri and its tributaries. And it sucks out all the water in the area. That's why it needs to be close to the river. And then it, it excretes salt. And so in areas where it's at, you look all around the base of this plant and it's just salty. And you can, I, you can even kind of see that a little bit in the picture, the white um, adjacent to the plant. And that's the salt that that plant has excreted. The bottom um, picture, that's zebra mussels. Zebra mussels are here in the state. They've been discovered along the Red River and eventually they probably will, will find their way into all water bodies. Um, the state is doing, our department encourages all anglers to empty their live wells and wash off their boats if they do um, change, um, they go to a different lake or different river. And we do spot inspections as well in an effort to curb the transfer of, of um, zebra mussels. Up at the top right, we've got cattle grazing. I, I'm not picking on, on ranchers on this one. I just want you to be aware that um, it can be too much of a good thing. And so you've got a fence here and you can see on the right hand side that um, the area was grazed quite heavily. And on the left hand side of the fence, it hasn't been grazed and you can see how lush that vegetation is. Um, this was taken in Western North Dakota. So we know um, they don't get as much moisture. So you really need to be careful with, with grazing in areas like that. Other, other threats to habitat, any type of pesticide application, if it does not land on its intended area can be a threat. And so you can see where someone did a little overspray and they got that beautiful tree Half of it's gone, the leaves are gone because of pesticide application. And you can see the other half um, is still doing quite well. So that's what happens when you miss spray. Agriculture development, once again, not picking on anybody, but once you plow up an area, um, it can be gone. And so that is a threat to the habitat, as is urban development. That picture is taken in North Bismarck when they were building Legacy High School. That was native prairie and now it's all developed with with homes and school and industry and and so that habitat is gone from our region and then lastly energy development mostly confined to western north dakota that's a picture from the badlands of course and so in addition to building a pad um, taking out that native native short grass prairie they've also had to build a road to get to that pad and so that degrades that habitat. Threats to wetlands specifically, wetlands in the last 100 years have been drained or, and, and that's because of development. So not just agriculture, agriculture initially was a huge threat to wetlands because a lot of wetlands were drained. And you can see in that image, that's from um, the, habit, the wetland habitat guide, um, the arrow indicates the same wetland several years later. And so in the first picture, you've got 
a large wetland, but look at all those little wetlands around it. They're still full of water. And then in the picture to the left, you've still got the large wetland is even larger and the little wetlands, they're all but gone. And so what has happened is those small wetlands have been all drained into the larger wetland. So if you think back of, to what we said about benefits of a wetland, well, you're not gonna reduce erosion because, because the wetlands are gone. You're not gonna reduce pollutants because that wetland, those wetlands are gone. And so um, even though you've got a big wetland there, it does not have the same impact for um, positive on, on the environment. Wetlands act as a giant sponge. So they soak up all those things and, and keep them there to, so the water can disperse and soak into the ground. So you end up with less flooding and, and all those other things that we talked about. So wetlands have been drained for agriculture, but also for housing developments and highway. Um, there've been um, a lot of um, highway developments in the last couple of years when we had the high water years where they were closed roads and you'd end up taking detours where they're building up the highways so they could go over the high water areas. And those areas are subject to drain. So we can drive from one side of the state to the other. Threats to wetlands and riparian. So we're looking at all aquatic habitats, sedimentation and nutrification that occurs when the soil is washed um, from the land into the water. Um, a lot of times the nutrients in the soil, they attach to that soil. And so that when they get washed into the water, they dissolve and then which ends up um, increasing the nutrients in the water and you end up with an algae bloom and um, reduction in oxygen in that water body. And so you end up with fish kills and things like the toxic blue green algae blooms that we have seen a lot of in the state as well. And then of course, threats to riparian habitats are dams. I talked a little bit about that with the Garrison Dam. Um, when they built the Garrison Dam, they flooded thousands of trees and they reduce the natural flow of the water as well. Um, at the bottom, you see I threw in a beaver dam. Um, beavers are naturally occurring and, and this happens all the time in nature, but it does flow the, slow the flow of the water and um, changes the dynamics of that stream. So something to think about. Threats to woodland, fire. Fire is a big threat to woodlands. Um, you'll hear that with a fire, um, woodlands can be regenerated and they, the forests regrow. And that's true, but it's not instantaneous. It's not even in 20 years. So when a fire comes through and it wipes out a woodland area, it's gonna be more like 50 years before you're gonna see woodlands again. And so I realize I'm a little short time, but um, what can you do? Well, First of all, the Habitats in North Dakota program is free to everyone. And so if your library wants a copy of these books or you're teaching a class and you want books for every student, um, I will provide them to you at no charge. All you have to do is get a hold of me, tell me how many you need and where I should send them and I'm happy to do so. Um, the other thing you can do is get outside and, and explore some of those different habitats. If you're somebody that wants to take off and just explore, go for it. But there are a lot of um, state and national parks that, that are happy to provide you with interpretive services and safe walking trails. And, and so you can explore the different habitats that way as well. And so I just wanna thank everybody for the opportunity to share this information. And if you have any questions, I will take them now, or um, you can sure drop me a line and email or give me a call if you want materials or want me to speak at another event. So um, thank you. Well, thank you, Sherry. This is very informative. I love, I, lo I love the diversity of environments in our state. Um, I try to tell people that because I, I moved to North Dakota 20 years ago from Pennsylvania. And I, their first impression is like, is it cold there nine years, nine months out of the year? I'm like, no. <laughs> but I tell them, you know, it's just a really, it's a beautiful state. 
It is. Um, I'll share a funny story with you. My dad was in the military and um, he got transferred to Minot Air Force Base when I was 16. And we were moving from Massachusetts. So as a 16 year old, it was very traumatic to me. And um, we crossed the border, went through Fargo, we're cruising up 94 and I'm looking out the window and my dad looks at me in the back seat and he says, go ahead, you can run away, but I can see you for three days from here. So, <laughs> so I'm still here, I, I love it here. Um, you know, it, it isn't flat, it isn't boring at all. I mean, but it's what you make of it too, I guess. Yeah, Al, I think you're a liar because it is cold nine months out of the year. And that's someone who grew up in the Midwest in Chicagoland. So um, I always say the difference is in Chicago, it might dip below zero, but it comes back up. <laughs> not, not necessarily in North Dakota, but Sherry, I, I'll echo Al's thanks uh, as I've been stepping on our staff's toes in every of the presentation and stealing their thank yous. Um, so Al jumped in to beat me to it. Well done, Al. But that you, you shared such great information on both days about resources that I bet a lot of our libraries didn't even know were available from Game and Fish, the kits and the trunks and all that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for spending your time with us and sharing such great information. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Any questions from the group for Sherry? I had a question. Um, I, I remember you starting out the program and you said that this particular area had the most pollinators. Yeah, that, that first, very first picture, that first slide. Let's see if so, we can back to it. Um, when you, you know, how do you determine pollinators? Are you talking about the number of plants? Oh, that's a whole nother presentation, but. Um, <laughs> oh, but, I opened a can of worms. <laughs> no, that's okay. So, um, so pollinators are anything that transfer pollen from plant to plant. So people always think of butterflies and bees, but there's a lot of other things like ants and different beetles and, and any kind of critter that goes through there. There's hummingbirds. And even you could be a pollinator if your pant leg would brush the pollen from one. Um, plant to another. So this field is full of, this is when the, the um, purple prairie clover was in bloom and it was just a sea of lavender is beautiful. And so when the re researchers from NDSU went, they go and they, they take these big nets and they kind of sweep them across and they catch the bugs basically. That's what they're looking at. And um, they count not only the different species, but which would be the diversity of the pollinator species, but also the number of pollinators in the area, because that's an indicator of health of the environment. And so they're looking at native pollinators. Um, the honeybees aren't native, but I know there's hives just over the hill on this, on this place. And so they did get some honeybees, but yeah, it, it was very dense and diverse. So it's a beautiful field and it's, it's healthy. And um, it's, it's noted that this is actually restored prairie. It was once broken for crops and they restored it with native nice. plants. Did that Thank answer you. your question, Carmen? It, it does, it does. Okay. It's always neat to see those lands that get restored back to the native as well. It's, it's just always so beautiful when that happens well. I agree. Any other questions? Well, once again, thank you for these pres both presentations. Were, I, I thought were very good. Um, thank you, Al. I was just thinking, like, my, my eight-year-old's going to love all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fortunately, I get to go visit a group of fourth graders tomorrow, so we're going <laughs> to we're gonna really play with the trunk instead nice. of just looking at pictures. Fun. Do you do that a lot, Sherry? Are you in the classrooms a lot? I do. This year was kind of slow because of COVID, but um, I visit all the universities, all the teaching universities and their classrooms. 
to show student teachers how to use this material. And then um, I do spend some time in, in the classrooms. They, I have a standard group of schools that always call me. They, they like the stuff and we have a good time. And then in the summertime, I get to do some, some other in the field type workshops. Do you guys do programs out at Game and Fish? We do. We do. Um, like summer programs for kids? You know, it's kind of hit and miss right now where the person who usually does that is, well, they left. And so we're filling the position again. And okay. you know how that goes. But um, we do have, on, on the topic of Game and Fish, we do have an owl site, an outdoor wildlife learning site at the department. And it's free. Anybody can come. We're open daylight hours. So, I mean, even after work, when we, we're closed, you can walk. There's hiking trails through the different habitats that we have. We have some naturally occurring wetlands. We have uh, engineered wetland where you can go fishing. Um, and then we have some woodland areas, some prairie area, and we have an engineered um, badlands habitat as well. And it's just kind of a nice hike. Um, get you, even though it's in the city, it's get you out of the city. We see all kinds of critters there. There's waterfowl, there's different kinds of geese and ducks and birds. Um, we have there's deer turkey out there because I scared one up. Yeah, there's all kinds of critters. There, so. <laughs> he so flew very close to my head. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sherry, the program that you do like in the schools where, you, where you'll take a trunk to a classroom, would you do that also? Like if Tracy's library wanted to host you for a summer reading, would you, is that an option? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I just I threw out Tracy's name because she's the librarian I see on my screen that's not with State Library. <laughs> yeah, so. no, I've got a couple of different school type programs that are pretty well received. The trunk, of course, is a big hit. Um, I do fish printing, which is always fun. Um, and then I do owl pellets. And then I do a, a whole thing on pollinators as well. Oh, so those are kind great. of the four biggies. Okay, that's that's really good for our libraries to know. Awesome. Yeah. So if anyone is wondering where the game and fish department is, if you are headed, um, if you're on the Bismarck Expressway or Centennial turns into Bismarck Expressway, heading west, it's right before the prison. Yes, or you can, take, you can take Main Street East, and um, we are on the southwest corner of Main Street and the Bismarck Expressway. It's a big brick building. And that's where the habitat is that you were talking about, Sherry? Yes, yes. Okay. Just park in the front of the building, and there's a big sign, and you go walking across the bridge and explore all the different areas. Yeah, there's a couple cool. different areas. I took my Cub Scout group out there Yeah. for our Very nature cool. hike. Awesome. Well, to our participants, we just want to thank you for spending the afternoon with us. We really appreciate, we know that your time is a gift. Hopefully today was beneficial in some way and that you learned some things. And um, hopefully next year, maybe we'll be back in person or a combination of in-person and streaming. But um, it just, it's always, we always just really appreciate you guys spending time with us and giving us that gift. And we will hopefully see everyone soon, either in person or online.